I'm Thomas Walker. With the United States staring down the fiscal cliff and facing swelling debt, the most important factor affecting the United, the United States individuals and businesses are changes in our tax laws. China and Monaco are two very prosperous nations, but have enacted very different and somewhat opposite tax laws. Uh, I will discuss the, in contrast the different tax laws across all three nations. Well, kind of concluding with my own policy moving forward if I were to change the fiscal cliff. Uh, I'm going to start by kind of talking about the histories of modern China and Monaco, just so that we have kind of an understanding of some different countries that are emerging into our, our uh, global markets. And uh, you cannot really do business without China these days. And Monaco is one of these big tax havens that I think are just important to talk about in kind of comparison to the United States tax laws. So let's first kind of start by saying, you know, the fiscal cliff has been portrayed in the media as kind of this horrible thing for businesses. And this generally kind of leaves individuals without a real description of what the fiscal cliff is or why is it significant to them. And the fiscal cliff refers to the automatic tax increases and spending cuts which were put in place from the prior 2011 debt ceiling negotiations. Uh, this is in response to a growing deficit of over $16 trillion. Uh, if the U.S. pretty much ignores this increasing debt, we jeopardize going into default meaning we would lose the ability to pay our bills, uh, lose credit across the world, and sending our markets into a grease-like situation where it would just be a free, free fall. Uh, that would be very scary, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, the situation would then create a need for something more drastic than the restrictions in the fiscal cliff, which will seem very mild compared to what we'd have to do. So uh, just to give you a stat, according to the International Monetary Foundation in 2011, the U.S. had 104% of debt to GDP. Uh, to get a sense of where the U.S. stands in the world, it's just above where Ireland is, 105%. Portugal, 107%. Italy, 120%. You know, many of these places have been talked about in the news. Greece, 161%. And to top it off, we have Japan at 230%. I would first like to touch on uh, corporate tax rates and discuss the treatment of foreign income. Uh, corporate tax rates are currently not affected by the fiscal cliff but corporate tax rates are taxed at a maximum of 35%, which if I have a chart, I will show it now. Uh, it is showing that the United States has kept a very steady uh, high corporate tax level while the world has steadily declined, which is gonna be a big incentive for these corporations to just go ahead and, and leave if it just keeps going further and further away. Uh, if the U.S. gets too far out of equilibrium, then there will be a major shift in corporations, either through transfer pricing, mergers, or physical relocation of headquarters to a different country. Uh, this in turn causes decline in jobs and overall GDP. Another downside facing the United States tax laws are the treatment of, is the treatment of foreign income. All foreign income is currently taxed at the maximum rate of your bracket. So in other words, when you bring that, repatriate that money back to America, it is going to be taxed even more than what it was in the foreign country, which is bizarre. I mean, every other country in the world only recognizes country money made in their own country. The United States is the only one that does this. This is a big, big disadvantage because... We are cutting money coming back into the economy, which would, in an essence, boost our economy even more in a time that we really need the money coming back into our economy. So I definitely agree with Dr. Ler 
Mason de la Forge's uh, theory of just getting rid of this law and if just because it's causing us, we're not collecting any taxes from it because nobody's bringing it back and we're just losing out on money coming back. The fiscal cliff has major tax increases that come from the repeal of both the Bush tax cuts and the Obama payroll tax cuts. The ending of the Bush tax cuts would mean an across the board increase of taxes. Uh, there would no longer be a 10% 10, 10 uh, bracket and the top four brackets would rise from 25, 28, 33, and 35% to 28, 31, 36, and 39.6%. I will provide you with a chart with this right now. Uh, also with the Bush tax cuts, uh, married filing jointly would receive only 167% of the standard deduction of the single filer meaning we wouldn't get the normal 200% double the amount of the single like you're supposed to. So another disadvantage towards married uh, individuals. Uh, the Obama payroll tax cuts are directly affecting the working class also. So it's important to note that this is going to affect low to upper middle income earners immediately. So if not continued, the employers will still pay a 7.65% FICA tax, which uh, ma is made up of a Social Security tax and Medic Medicare tax. But the employee will increase from the 5.65% to 7.65%. Plus an additional, now this is a new, th new thing, 0.9% on the wages over 200,000. And this is 250,000 for married filing jointly. So this is uncapped, this can go as high as it wants. Whereas the Social Security, uh, the 6.2% on Social Security is capped at $113,700 of income. Now, what this means is that high income earners do not have to pay that, that Social Security tax beyond that point. So there are, it's, it's an unfair tax. It's a recessive tax because the, the higher earned income have, pay a lower percentage versus somebody who uh, would pay in the whole, if you made 100,000, you're gonna pay the whole amount into social security versus somebody who makes 200,000 who would not only have to pay maybe uh, six, 55, 56% of their income into, into that. So very, very important, I think, moving forward to change that. I'm gonna to get to that at the end, I'm moving a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, it's something I'm passionate about, so. Uh, we we have some serious issues, I mean, with both Social Security and Medicare. If we want to keep both of them, I mean, we're really going to need to start thinking about it because these are two of the largest unfunded liabilities for America. I mean, this is at least 16 trillion and 84 trillion uh, unfunded and this is 16 trillion is the Social Security and 84 trillion would be the Medicare. So very, very serious. I mean, much larger than even our current public debt. Not being talked about much in the media is the AMT tax patch or the preferential tax rate on capital gains and dividends. The AMT or alternative minimum tax is a parallel tax system with a nearly flat 26% or 28% depending on your taxable income, less an exemption, only they allow just a few minor deductions. So it's a pretty near flat tax. Uh, it's important to note though that preferential rates do, preferential rates do apply on capital gains and dividends. So they do get that deduction still. Uh, the exemption is currently at $74,450 for married filing jointly, $48,450 for singles, and this would drastically drop to $45,000 and $33,750 uh, for singles. Uh, if Congress doesn't intervene, this is gonna really affect the middle and upper middle class. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office projects that 28 million taxpayers will face higher taxes when this occurs. If uh, 
they pass a patch like they have been doing, they project only 5 million people will be affected by the AMT tax. So that's 23 million people that will have new taxes that will be burned, which again is the middle and upper middle class. Uh, pretty much the lifeblood of our economy. Although, if we do go ahead and let these Bush tax cuts get to be put repealed and the AMT patch fall back to 45,000 and 33,000, like we said, uh, it's projected by the Congressional Budget Office that we will save $221 billion in that first year and more going forward. So that is that is a big significant savings that uh it's not savings, it's tax revenue, and it's revenue that we definitely need, and it's something that needs to be put away towards our deficit. So something very serious that if we don't do it, then it'll probably be something worse down the road. Uh, on the business side, dividends are currently taxed at 15%, as well as all capital gains. Uh, dividends are set to go up to being taxed at your tax bracket, which is a huge uh, battle for these businesses. This will increase the double taxation, and they are going to fight this tooth and nail. I mean, this is not going to be an easy battle for uh, to raise that up if there's no concession to lowering corporate taxes. Uh, on the other side, capital gains will go from 15% to 20%, which will affect the Warren Buffetts and the Mitt Romneys of the world. So definitely affecting the wealthy, wealthiest wealthy. Uh, the serious long-term effects could just be stunted growth, but I really don't predict, predict any uh, major shocks because I think a lot of this has pre kind of pre been predicted for quite a while. Uh, kind of how, seeing how this is so, so uh, difficult for the United States and how many businesses have to deal with this constant bickering in Congress. It's easy to see why other countries like Monaco and China offer more advantageous or more stable policies. But I mean, we're going to investigate those countries here in just a moment. So there are downsides too. So uh, the next we're going to talk about China and briefly kind of just discuss their history. In 1911, China had its first revolution under Sun Yat-sen, overthrowing centuries-old imperial rule to declare the Republic of China. This opened China to many developments from the outside world. Now, when I talk about China's history, it's especially important to know history in China, really, because there is a great deal of importance culturally placed on their past and history. I mean, China sees themselves as the center of civilization, quote unquote, the Middle Kingdom. So even with some reforms and the opening to the outside world, China still steadily lost power under the initial republic. So according to The Economist, uh, I'll just give you the, the graph now. Uh, the, the GDP decline was 32%. Well, it declined from 32% in 1820 of the world's GDP to 6% in 1940. Uh, this led to Mao Zedong taking power in 1949. And he did some very extreme radical moves uh, to change China's lifestyle. He, uh, Mao wisely ended the feudal system, you know, ending land ownership by lords, which was big. But unfortunately, he uh, also started what was called the Cultural Revolution, which was very suppressive against imperialist, capitalist ideas, any kind of relics or artifacts, as well as religious sites. So anything that was against communism, they were just going to destroy. Uh, very extreme. Everybody had to dress alike. So, I mean, it was a very serious society. Uh, obviously, business didn't flourish under Mao. I mean, this is way too radical. But he eventually passed away in 1976, and this led to a new era from uh, ruler of Deng. His name is Deng Xiaoping. Very important to know Deng Xiaoping. Uh, he was the great business reformer for China. Uh, leading a new wave of reforms, he brought big, big companies to China, in the late 70s. Uh, this included Coca-Cola and 
as well as Boeing. So very big companies that China needed to get the ball rolling with, you know, to get their the trade trade going again. Uh, Deng obviously opened up those new Western ways. Uh, he set new goals for China that were clearly set for technology. And this is what drives China today, is their technology se- sector, which uh, is reflected in their tax system, interestingly, uh, which I'll get to here in, in a minute. But uh, to go on a little bit more about China, the market's uh, foundation for modern business China is Deng's old adage of to be rich is glorious. So very, very uh, capitalistic idea of being rich is, is great. I mean, it's almost a greedy, a greedy thing to say. Uh, under his power from 1970 to, to 2008, we can see that the GDP rose from 4% to 17% of the world's GDP. So very, very uh, big rise while the rest of the world was declining, except for India was the only one to as climb as well. But China was the by far the rapidest, most rapid uh, emerging economy that we can see from this graph. Uh, today, China leads the world in inward investing and continually increases outward investing to other countries and has the greatest trading power amongst any other nations. Another chart that I will give it to you now uh, shows the exponential increase in foreign exchange reserves. This shows kind of the power that China has uh, having money coming into it, the excess power of capital and and able to just be resilient even through this last recession. I mean, this China's growth has helped the whole world economy rebound faster from the recession. So we have a lot to thank for China for having such a uh, a muted recession, which could have been way worse. Uh, however, everything is not so great in China. Problems that face China include inequality in society, uh, maintaining su- sustainability from growing uh, so quickly, I mean, and using up so many natural resources. I mean, workers obviously feel injustice from uh, this big inequality from the rich and poor. We can see this in the writings throughout uh, China, uh, through Foxconn or uh, many of the other uh, electronics factories. Many of these communities are even near slave labor. So, I mean, there should be some sort of crackdown on that. Uh, That's not my intention in this paper, but there should be some focus for businesses to to see that there are... uh, human rights issues that are involved in China, which is a very big country risk. So as an emerging power, China has looked to its past for its identity, and this is reflected in its state-run relations. Any business entering into China should know Confucianism. This is the dominant philosophy that dictates ideas, and understanding Confucianism is critical to comprehending relationships amongst businesses and business leaders. So uh, it's not... in not important that you have to understand all of Confucianism, but to have a basics of Confucianism would be very helpful when dealing with anybody in China. Uh, The central idea of Confucianism is societal harmony. So it's very, very important to understand that harmony is used very often in China's culture. With such a complicated past comes a complicated tax system. China's tax system has been uh, known as one of the most complex, bureaucratic, and detailed. Uh, The U.S. tax system is also quite complex. However, the U.S. tax system has been established and more stable, barring this fiscal cliff changes coming up. Uh, On the other hand, China has been, been trying to equalize their taxes and become a little bit more easier, even though it's still pretty quite cumbersome. Uh... In the past, there were tax holidays for foreign companies. This is not true anymore. The only companies that get tax breaks are the high-tech companies, which is a mainstay from uh, Deng Xiaoping. I mean, there is still that sense that high-tech drives this economy and high-tech is the future, which has been holding true and may hold true for a long time. Uh, Today, there are no no more tax holidays. Like I said, Uh, companies in Hong Kong, or mainland China 
foreign or domestic pay almost the same tax rates. Uh, these tax laws should be noted international business because the significant shift to be more internationalized. The main business tax is enterprise income tax, which is a uniform 25% rate, which is based on net profits earned. Uh, there are exceptions for low profit industries at 20% and high tech industries at 15%. China does this because Dang's lasting culture of uh, supporting the high tech and 15% more, more, than health, more than helps it. Uh, then there's also a value added tax, which is placed on manufacturing uh, this is when you buy goods or raw materials and turn it into something that's more valuable. That difference between the cost and what you sell it for is what is being taxed. So if you bought something for $11, sold it for $20, that $9 represents the tax. Uh, that is, uh, like I said, 17%. Uh, the other tax, if you're not subject to the value added tax, is a business tax. And this is when the service uh, or customer is based in China or uh, from China. And this is generally between three and 5%. Then there's also consumption tax that is placed on all kinds of things, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, cosmetics, jewelry, fireworks, gasoline, lumber products, sporting equipment, uh, lots of different areas. So each area you have your business needs to be uh, researched in the consumption tax area because they can range from 1% to 50%. Uh, the high percentages are mostly tobacco and cosmetics, and the smaller ones are more like gasoline. So uh, there is a big range there. There are other smaller taxes that are, that are related to rentals, like urban real estate uh, tax and urban construction and maintenance tax, which is another tax if you want to build in China. So, uh, I mean, there are several taxes that can hit you. Uh, just be aware that uh, there are they're more than just the basic business tax, and there are very, very wide ranges of taxes. So it's going to be worth your time to hire a, a, a well-trained uh, industry-related tax accountant in China. On the opposite side of the spectrum in taxes, size, and history is Monaco. Monaco, officially called the Principality of Monaco, is a very small nation of less than two kilometers squared off the coast of, French, of the French Riviera. Well known for its famous casino Monte Carlo, it's a haven for the wealthiest of the world. Uh, it, it first gained its sovereignty in 1861 from the franco monegasque Treaty. It had absolute power as a prince until 1910 when a constitution was uh, reigned in. Uh, it was briefly occupied during World War II by both uh, Italy and then Germany. There were rumors of Nazi money laundering. Uh, after the war, they regained their independence and uh, still the military was maintained by the French. So there were some shaky relationships between the French and, and Monaco to begin with because Monaco did have some Italian uh, residents and still do today. Today, Monaco enjoys some of the most mildest and beautiful, most beautiful temperatures in the world. Some of the most great landscapes of sea and beauty and great world-class gambling facilities, which I would enjoy. I, I love poker. So, uh, which drive the demand for immigration and tourism to this great uh, little place. However, before you pack your bags, you have to realize that tourism and residency can be very highly expensive. Uh, it's important to understand the process of becoming a resident. Uh, it's very lengthy. You have to have over a million dollars in deposits in a Monaco bank. And you. it's not that it takes a long time, but you have to be very wealthy and be willing to afford to pay high prices while you're there too. So you're not going to need more than just a million dollars. You're probably going to need multiple millions of dollars just to live there. Uh, but the biggest benefit of being a resident there in Monaco is the greatest tax system in the world, a 0% income tax. 
uh, taxpayers from around the world abuse the banking system by simply setting up a bank account, much like they do in the Cayman Islands, and they transfer income into the account without actual residency and neglect to report the income back to their home country. Uh, Monaco is on both the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering list of uncooperative tax havens and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's blacklist of tax havens. So two, uh, two big lists that they are on as being tax havens. Uh, fortunately, Monaco-U.S. relations have been somewhat mitigated by the signing of a 2009 exchange of tax information, which allows us, us to go after t supposed tax evaders. Uh, I couldn't find any results to this, but I am assuming that it had to have really uh, some of the uh, strain between both of our nations. Uh, the taxes that face Monaco in the corporate business side are uh, corporate income tax, social security tax, and a value-added tax. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, corporations face no income tax if, if uh, more than 25% of their business is done in Monaco, if, uh, which is going to be majority of businesses don't qualify. So most businesses are going to have to pay the business tax. The business tax is fairly high. It's at 33.33%, but still lower than America's tax rate. Uh, and what uh, Monaco does to even give you further benefits if you move to Monaco is they give you a reduction in tax bill. And I'll give you a little graph for that right now. Uh, the breaks includes uh, for 0% payable. So in a sense, you get no taxes the first two years. Uh, you only have to pay a quarter of your taxes the third year, half your taxes the fourth year, three, quarter of your, three quarters of your tax the fifth year, and then following that, your sixth year and beyond, you just have to pay your full tax bill. But that's a very huge incentive to have big, huge tax breaks up front and really can uh, drive business to that place. And that's why it has become a leading banking sector in the world. Uh, with over a hundred billion euros in deposits that they have claimed, the liability uh, the liability f of of uh, doing business with them is uh, not knowing for sure if the account that you're depositing into is a legitimate account or not. So, if you are worried about a client's account being in Monaco, I would strongly advise to ask for a residency or proof of residency, which would be a residency permit. Uh, it's important to know that capital gains are taxed at the corporate rate and that Social Security tax is similar in the U.S. to both the employee and the employer in that they both pay. However, the employer pays a much, much larger chunk. The employer has to pay between 28 and 40 percent versus only 7.6 percent here of the gross wages, which include the benefits. So that's even a larger chunk than just wages. But the, fortunately, the employee only has to pay between uh, 10 and 14%, which is quite a bit lower. Uh, this can be a major disadvantage to hiring, to having people hired in Monaco because of the higher uh, social security tax in place. Uh, despite this, over 48,000 workers come in every day uh, from France and Italy uh, to service the 35,000 local citizens. The last tax I'd like to touch on there is simply the value-added tax, which is set at 5.5%. Uh, if it is a property, then it's 19.6%, although properties are waived if you have owned it for over five years. So in closing, uh, Monaco is a great place if you can afford it. <laughs> Most of us will not be able to, but for business sake, it's a very viable option, especially if you're not going to have very many uh, people to have to move into headquarters. Uh, very, very big tax savings that are available for moving initially. And also, I didn't touch that businesses have no withholding on dividends. Uh, so that's also another big tax break. I'm going to play a short clip for you right now, uh, just showing you how the tax minister in Monaco Obviously, he likes to dodge the question of being a tax haven.
Monaco. When they talk about playgrounds of the rich and famous, this is exactly what they mean. This place offers the ultimate combination of sun, sea, and lots and lots of money. On days like this, the harbour feels like it's dripping in cash and the streets are dripping in bling. This tiny principality was once famously described as a sunny place for shady people. Monaco officially has 35,000 residents, but more than 350,000 bank accounts. In those accounts, more than $100 billion. It was just a few months ago, in the midst of a global economic meltdown, world leaders decided to launch a crackdown on tax havens. Monaco, being one of the most famous, became a symbolic target. The banking secrecy of the past must come to an end. So, what's changed? And are they really serious about closing these places down? It's very unfair to attack uh, small states on this subject. Particularly Monaco? And particularly, of course, my country, who is maybe more attacked than other ones because uh, Monaco is a symbol, Monaco is well known. Maybe a lot of people are jealous of the success of Monaco, and that's the reason why we are so attacked at that time. Monaco was desperate to cast itself off the global tax haven blacklist. So, after a brief period of reflection, they agreed to abide by international standards and start signing bilateral agreements allowing information exchanges. But that only happens if the other country already has enough evidence to make a case against someone for tax evasion. And Monaco is defiantly standing by its code of banking secrecy. In April, Monaco finally agreed to launch an investigation into accounts belonging to Edith Bongo, the dead wife of Gabon's late president, Omar Bongo. The accounts are thought to contain $75 million worth of allegedly stolen money. It's one token investigation. Apart from that, Monaco's foreign minister admits it's business as usual. You'll still encourage the super rich to move here and not pay tax? If they live here, why not? But again, Monaco is only a two square kilometer of state. So, you know, we have problem of space. So we cannot have all the world, all the entire world living in Monaco. If you want to understand the rich and famous, you really need to travel like the rich and famous. And from up here, the world looks pretty good. Monaco is now actively pursuing what it calls URIs, ultra-rich individuals. And the helicopters are just part of the deal. The world super-rich are brought here on tailor-made holidays to give the ultimate VIP treatment. One catch is that to become eligible, you have to be worth at least $30 billion. People and companies wanting to bury their money are still choosing to land here in Monaco. So long as we have that opacity and a lack of information about what is going on, we'll have market imperfections, the cost of capital will be too high, we'll put money into the wrong things, we won't create an efficient marketplace. That worries me. So despite all the promises of an end to banking secrecy by the G20, the shadowy world of offshore banking is alive and well. No wonder the French call it paradis fiscal, a fiscal paradise.